Welcome back to the Mulpix podcast. Today, our guest is Catherine Dunn. Also here today are Boya. Hello. Georgios. Hi. And I'm Hannah. Catherine completed her undergraduate degree in physics at the University of Oxford. She started a PhD there in terahertz spectroscopy before seeing the light and changing to DNA origami. She has continued to study molecular programming within an engineering context, working on DNA nanomachines for bioelectronic computing at the University of York. She is now a senior lecturer at the University of Edinburgh and has been named as one of the top 50 women in engineering 2021 by the Women's Engineering Society. Catherine, hi. Hi, Hannah. Hi, Boya. Hi, Georgius. Um, thanks so much for coming on. So um, I guess the first question I, I want to find out more about is what made you end up switching from more conventional physics, like terahertz spectroscopy, into molecular programming? How did you even come across this field? Well, that's a that's a bit of a long story, but I'll give you the succinct version. So first of all, thank you very much for inviting me along. I guess the um, first um, contact I had with molecular programming was really when I was an undergraduate. Um, and then when I was a PhD student, terahertz spectroscopy wasn't really working out for me. So that's when I moved into DNA nanotechnology. Um, but in some ways, I've been interested in biology for a very long time, as well as physics. So um, I think my biology teacher at school was quite disappointed when I was insistent I was going to go and study physics rather than um, biology. I remember being particularly interested in genetics um, in the biology I studied at school. So I think it was inevitable that at some point the two worlds would collide and I would uh, end up in biophysics. Um, but it, it took a while for me to actually get there. Yeah, and, and how did you, so you, you knew you had the interest in biology and, and the interest in physics yeah. and that leads on to biophysics, but what about, say, DNA origami in particular? What, did you run into Andrew Turberfield at, at Oxford and, and then find out that way? It was all kind of by chance, really, that I, I ended up in that field, but I remember particularly once I'd started the PhD in DNA nanotech, um, the pretty much the first thing that happened after I got some DNA, I sort of held it up in the um, office and said, so what do I do with this then? And uh, one of my um, fellow PhD students said, well, you resuspend it to 100 micromolar in one times TE. And I went, you do what with what to what? Um, so then one of the postdocs very kindly said to me, OK, we'll go and take it one step at a time and led me off to the lab and showed me how you actually deal with that. So. It was an interesting transition going from um, hardcore physics to the sort of um, biophysics um, because it's a completely different kind of laboratory experience. And um, I mean, it's very it, it's, it's a very interesting journey to take. And it's one that quite a lot of people have taken. What's quite interesting now is that actually there are quite a, there are a few people moving from biology into the engineering and physics, which is the reverse journey um but it's only in the last few years that that's become a phenomenon it used to be the case that physics was the export science and biology and so on were the receiving science but now you see some biologists and biochemists going the other way which is a different journey but also a very interesting one what do you think might be the reason for for that kind of shift I think it's um, multifaceted, but one aspect of it is the existence of new programs that specifically encourage um, students to switch disciplines. Um, the other thing I think is that when you get physicists and engineers moving into biology, biologists inevitably see some physicists and engineers and think, oh, there's some cool stuff going on in that other department across the road. So. I, I think there are a lot of factors in, in play, um, but it's interesting that there are different challenges depending on which direction you go in. So if you go from the sort of physics and engineering side into the biology, the main challenge is sort of the terminology and, um, and, and getting used to a different kind of working, white lab coat and so on. Whereas if you go the other way, the challenge is usually in the mathematics and the equations and understanding how to quantify what you're working on, which I think is is something that could, in principle, be tackled by having more quantitative elements in undergraduate biology. And I think that would really help even for people who aren't planning to go and be physicists and engineers once they've learned some biology. I think it would be useful to have more quantitatively trained biologists. So do you think it's going to be more challenging for biologists to switch fears? 
It depends on the exact details of the project and on the program that they're doing. So, um, I mean, I've seen some biologists make a, an outstanding contribution in, more, in the more engineering side, um, but it, it it does depend on exactly what the project is. Because if you come in with a conventional biology undergraduate degree into a physics or engineering PhD and you're expected to do modelling and mathematics, that's going to be really, really steep learning curve. Do you think those sorts of undergraduates where they're very focused on one sort of science or another, so say the biological sciences versus physical sciences, do you think that those are in some way unhelpful? Um, Because it seems like interdisciplinary um, research is becoming increasingly common and and important and um i don't think that undergraduate degrees other suits those are as common um mine was slightly more towards that i I got to experience both biology and physics but i'm not sure whether whether we should focus more on on that for undergraduate students that is a really deep question Um, and i think one of the things that we need to be really careful about is answering this question with reference solely to research. We also need to look at where else the undergraduates go. So if you look at, for example, a physics degree, a lot of the undergraduates will go off and do finance. Um, and in finance, they probably don't care if someone knows what a cell is in, a, in an organism. They want to know whether someone can do complicated maths with a sort of practical bent. If you're looking at engineering, then the major consumer of our undergraduates is actually industry rather than research. And industry may want some interdisciplinary training, they may not, but there will be core skills that they want those undergraduates to have. So I think we need to be very careful about considering what skills are necessary in an undergraduate degree solely in the context of research. And we should also be careful about assuming that all undergraduate degrees should follow the same model. I think diversity is good. I mean, there are some areas where you definitely want somebody who is just a physicist or just a biologist, or and they have been trained to the highest possible levels in those subjects. In other areas, you want somebody who is interdisciplinary who may not have gone into quite the same depth in any one area, but has a breadth over multiple areas. Um, so I think there isn't one size fits all approach. Um, my my own view is that there should be a little bit of interdisciplinarity in every degree, but you don't necessarily need to go so far as to make a degree just science and try and cover everything, because at some point someone has to specialise. Um, so you can have degrees that are broader, but even on those degrees that are broader, there is still some element of specialisation. Um, it's just a question of how much and when. Um, so... Really deep question, but not a straightforward answer, I don't think. So you have organized a course named Bio-Inspired Engineering. So for that class, how did you, I assume you may have students with different backgrounds. So how did you um, attract those students and how did you handle students with different backgrounds? This is actually a really interesting question. You've clearly done your homework and uh, really poured poured over my, my bio. So... This question is um, related to a course that is mostly delivered for mechanical engineers, but some chemical engineering students, and it was later made available to some ex- to some other um, MSc students who are taking a taught postgraduate course. And um, it's been running for several years now, and the premise is that they come in with zero biology knowledge at all, and some of them have minimal chemistry as well. So the ambition is to take them from a level where they know nothing about the biological background to a point where they can actually look at a problem and come up with a bio-inspired solution whether that's through molecular programming whether it's through soft robotics whatever it is Um, so they're going from nothing right up to the cutting edge which means obviously that the course is broad rather than deep but I was actually influenced in the development of this with my experience teaching biophysics when I was a PhD student at Oxford because what I used to do when I was delivering some of those tutorials is to start off by summarising the basic biology to make sure that everyone was on the same page and they picked up what DNA is, what a cell is, and so on. Um, so that influenced me when I was starting off um, the development of this course. And then I basically begin by going, 
this is an atom, this is how, how they bond, this is a little bit of chemistry. So really the basic high school chemistry, nothing about quantum physics or anything like that. And then that gets me up to basic biological molecules, DNA, proteins, um, and that kind of thing. And that I can deliver in the first two, three lectures, really. And then I can get into the really interesting cut, cutting edge stuff. And by about lecture four, I think it is, they're looking at DNA nanotechnology. It might be lecture five, I can't remember the exact numbering. But they cover, they also cover synthetic biology, bio-inspired robotics, a little bit of artificial intelligence. Um, we do a, a bit about biophysical methods just because it's interesting to look at how these things are studied once you've made them, if you're building um, molecular devices. Um, and of course, there's a big, there's part of the course that's on ethics and um, legal matters and safety, the subtitle of which is basically um, how to avoid becoming a supervillain. Um, in that lecture, I particularly reference the uh, fiction book Frankenstein um, as just a sort of motivate discussion. Um, so it's quite a wide ranging course, but I literally start from this is this is an atom. And go right up to the um, complexity of, a, of DNA origami and um, synthetic biology. So it's a course that I really enjoy teaching. And um, I have a coursework assignment in which I say to students, pick a problem, any problem you like, anything in the real world, and propose something bio-inspired to solve it. And this is actually part of their assessment process. And the things they come up with are really remarkable. And they're, some of them really innovate. And I think, well... Um, you could go file a patent application on this, build a company and take it from there if you wanted to. But it just continues to impress me how much they can do when they're given the right tools. So moving on to your lab a bit. So um, you, your group, you started in kind of um, late 2017. And so about half of it has been run during the pandemic. Now that this is, well, no, we can't say it's over, but we're kind of... Uh, some senses moving on how, how have you found that has changed your research and lab culture both throughout and kind of nowadays well it's been a lot tougher than it usually would be but and it's tough under normal conditions to start a lab um i think the big thing was to just accept that things are going to take longer so for example getting to getting to the stage where everything's being published and it, and you're seeing your work come to fruition is going to come a bit later than it would without a global pandemic um and um, i mean i've been blessed with some absolutely fantastic phd students um so we've i i mean we've managed but there were some tough times when we kind of weren't able to access the lab so much um i mean during that period i was actually involved in quite a lot of covid related work so i personally pivoted and did stuff that wasn't related to molecular programming or bio nanotech or anything at all. We were making face shields and looking at all kinds of um, conventional engineering related to COVID. I mean, you name it, we looked at it at some point. Um, but when we started getting back in, um, obviously things took a while to get back up to speed. Um, and it hasn't been plain sailing, but I think one thing that makes it sort of a bit easier in the UK than perhaps in the US is that you're not necessarily you're not on a sort of ticking tenure track clock. So there isn't a sort of expectation that you'll tick off X boxes on a form saying you've published this many papers and so on. So it's OK if it takes a bit longer for you as an academic. Obviously, the main impact is on my PhD students. Um, I've done my best to make sure they're as well supported as possible. Um, and they are on track and they've had extensions where appropriate and this kind of thing. Um, but um, it's been tough, it's been tough and perhaps we haven't achieved as much as we would have under normal conditions, but things are now starting to come to fruition and the, we see, we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. So I think now the outlook is very positive, but there were times over the last few years where it's been, uh, we don't have access to a lab, we can't do the experiments, what do we do? We sit and twiddle our thumbs and try and do what we can to keep the wheels in motion so it's been tough but I'm sure that's a very common story and you yourselves will have had some experience of just how challenging it's been 
I, I wonder, what do you think the um, kind of postdoc landscape looks like for like these PhD students who, uh, like myself, have done basically done most of their PhD during the pandemic, and so, you know, with a lot of restricted lab access, maybe didn't get as many publications as they would have liked. Um, you know, while looking at their kind of fellow PhD students in computational sciences who maybe didn't affect them as much, right? It seems like the pandemic maybe unequalized the uh, the playing field a little bit for experimental versus theoretical PhDs. I wonder what you think is going to happen or what you think like these experimental PhDs should be looking for when entering the postdoc kind of space. Every PI is going to give you a different answer to that, but my hope is that the good PIs will be taking this into account because everyone has had the same experience. Um, and if somebody is looking at your CV and expecting the same publications that they would have seen before COVID, they are living in cloud cuckoo land, to my mind. Um, I mean, I don't think any experimental PhD student is going to have achieved during the last few years what they would have achieved under normal conditions. So my hope would be that PIs will be aware of that. Obviously, there will be some people who won't be aware of that but the question is do you really want to go and work with those people um because i wouldn't um so and i mean i I think the other thing is that it's not just your publications record that people should be looking at they should be looking at your other skills as well and they should be asking what you personally did on the papers so there'll be some people who will be co-authors on many papers but if their contribution to those papers was actually fairly minor and or they were continuing a project that someone else had started, maybe the PI who's looking at the CV is going to say, well, I'd rather have somebody who has fewer publications but shows me evidence of creating a project, of getting of taking it from start to finish rather than picking up something in the middle. So every PI is going to give you a slightly different answer on that. But I think... I mean, I personally do not look just at publications if I'm looking at a CV. I look at the whole package, I look at the skills, um, and I would look at what the individual has done and try and view it in context, because the whole the whole politics of publication is rather complicated. So, you know, I'm I'm not just I'm not one of the PIs who just goes to the CV, counts the papers, and looks at the impact back to the journals. I would never do that as a basis for. Um, selecting somebody at postdoc level if I'm looking if I were looking at somebody a lot further along in their career that might that might be a better measure but looking at someone who's just finishing a PhD in terms of number of papers and impact factor particularly during a global pandemic is is not a good way to judge people in my opinion so on some of your research um one of the things that um you, you in, in fact, one of the things you're trying to define, as I understand it, is the field of um, electrosymbionics. Could, could you say a little bit about what this is and what you're trying to do with it? Absolutely. So um, electrosymbionics is a new word. If you Google it, you'll probably get mostly me um, in the search results. Um, This is a term that captures the creation of engineered devices based on uh, biological components and the like for generation, use and storage of electricity. So we're talking biological photovoltaics, biobatteries and so on. And in most respects, this represents a departure from some of my previous research. It's effectively expanding from DNA into the use of other molecules and other biological systems. Um, This is motivated by um, a desire to attack one of the most pressing problems in the world, i.e. generation of clean energy in a zero carbon way. And I think biology has some really cool ways of harvesting light, for example, converting energy from one form to another, um, storing energy. And I think we can take advantage of that. I can't say too much about the specifics of those projects because they're still quite an early stage and also the information is sort of proprietary and so on. So um, all I can do is tell you what I'm trying to achieve, which is ideally the sort of holy grail of um, energy generation storage. So devices that can do better than silicon photovoltaics and lithium ion batteries, that, that, that sounds ambitious, but I think 
it might be doable. Obviously, we have we can't tell how well the devices will really perform until we actually build them. So what I really need is to get some funding to allow me to take the embryonic research I've got so far to the next level. And hopefully we get results in time to actually make a difference um, and we don't get beaten to the punch by um, all of the other groups who are trying to do exactly the same thing with different tools, biological and non-biological. Are you able to say, give, give any indication of how exactly they might work or like kind of the broad area? Because immediately my, my mind jumps on microbial fuel cells, right, which have been around for a while. Is this some yeah. kind of evolution upon that or complete, a completely novel um, like kind of way of doing things? I really don't think I can give the details at this at this okay. time. Um, so basically, keep an eye on my publications, and hopefully, you'll see something in the future. I mean, I mean microbial fuel cells are an example of one technology that I would put under the heading of electrosymbionics, but they have a number of disadvantages, and they're not going to produce on their own sufficient power for many real world applications. There are yeah. some applications where they could be very useful. Um, but we need to go better and we need to do that potentially using insights from physics. So this is where we get back to that question of interdisciplinarity and looking at how we um, use our understanding of physics to inform what we're doing with the biology and with the engineering. So I'd like to say more, but I really can't at this time because it's all very, very confidential. Um, so um, hopefully with time, there will be more results um, and more details of the technology to share. I imagine a bunch of these questions will be met with a similar response. <laughs> so I'll I'll try to make this somewhat broad so it can avoid infringing on confidentiality. So if we take a look at say um photovoltaics, so um the current silicon ones do all right. I'm not fully up to date with what their efficiency is, but I think like, what's it reach maybe about 20%, which is kind of not bad, but not amazing. And whenever you learn about photosynthesis, one of the things that's highlighted is the amazing quantum efficiency of these systems. But my understanding is that when we try to leverage these ourselves, we get far lower efficiencies than we're able to get with silicon. Could you say a bit about what the major roadblocks and challenges are in taking systems which when biology uses them are very efficient but when we try to make use of them on maybe a more industrial scale what what, what gets in the way of this the first thing actually to bear in mind is that efficiency means different things depending on who you talk to. So for conventional solid state photovoltaics, the concept of efficiency is very well defined. It's basically, a, to, an, to a sort of um, approximation, energy out as a fraction of the energy in, basically. Um, but when you're talking about photosynthesis, it gets a little bit more complicated because you talked about the quantum efficiency. That's true. But in plants, you also look at conversion into biomass and so on. So it's much more difficult to define the efficiency of photosynthesis. And if you go and, and look at some of the literature, um, people will actually refer to the overall efficiency of photosynthesis sometimes being very low because they're looking at a different fraction. So rather than sort of total energy out over total energy in, they're looking at a particular definition of energy out and a particular definition of energy in that aren't strictly comparable to silicon photovoltaics. So that's one aspect of the, of the answer. The other, other is that in living biological systems, they're using quite a lot of their energy to actually just stay alive, which can be a problem. So the, I, I think there are many challenges and roadblocks here, but um, one of them is finding a way to make biology do what you want it to, which is pa providing power for your application rather than power to stay alive. But if it doesn't have enough power to stay alive, then you won't, then the system will die and your whole technology has um, fall, fallen apart. The, however, it isn't necessarily just efficiency that you're interested in. So in some situations, you don't actually want particularly high efficiency or particularly high power. It depends what you're going for. So you need to define the application that you're looking at to define what what performance parameters you need. 
in some settings, um, there may be other factors that are of greater interest, and there may be other things that biology can give you that um, you just can't get from silicon um, or from men uh, other competing photovoltaic technologies. Um, but in terms of how you get over those roadblocks, I think we need to be quite imaginative in what we do and how we actually use the biology. Um, and I think I'll leave it there on that point. So, um, so it sounds like this is really, well, as you mentioned, interdisciplinary. For people who want to join you in these efforts, what would you recommend that they focus on learning? Well, in some ways, I'm more interested in potential than what you've already learned. So, I mean, normally I would look for having some of uh, some of the skills that you would need but not necessarily all of them so it, it does depend to a certain extent as to what level someone's joining me at if someone's joining me for a phd i definitely don't expect them to be fully trained i would expect that whenever a phd student arrives in the lab i personally am going to spend some time with them in the first weeks to make sure their lab skills are up, are up to scratch for example if someone's joining me as a postdoc, the needs will be different because with a postdoc, you've you've probably got less time to deliver the project and you need someone with a more specific set of skills, which I would always be articulating in the job advert. It's like, I need you to be able to do this, to do that, to do the other. But given a choice of somebody with great enthusiasm who has demonstrated high capability in one area, but might not have the skills in one particular area versus someone else who maybe doesn't have that enthusiasm I think I'd, I'd lean towards a sort of enthusiastic person with a great potential um so I think it's I'm not necessarily always interested in what skills you already have it's what you can acquire on the job um so if there are gaps in your CV I need to be confident that you can acquire those skills rapidly so I mean there will be gaps in everyone's CV unless you're applying for a job where the advert has been written for you there will always be something where you don't tick the box and the question is whether that's a showstopper or whether the person can bridge that gap so I think overall I'm more interested in potential and what what you can bring to a project um that you'll work hard without burning out obviously um and be and basically be a good and competent scientist and if you have gaps in your skill set that you will be able to overcome those. Um, I mean, I, I've changed field several times myself, so I have done this process of getting up to speed in a new field several times, um, and I think it it's important that someone has the ability to adapt to new challenges rather than necessarily ticking every box the first time. Having said that, there will, of course, be some cases where I might have a really short vacancy where I need someone who can come in with specific skills because there won't be time to acquire them and in that case it will literally be what it says in the job advert is what I'm looking for um there won't be a sort of there's no catch it's literally it's what it says on the tin the list of uh, requirements is what I need can you talk a little bit more about how your experience of changing field like do you like how did you start like picking the field and and finding the right knowledge that you need to learn. Can you talk more about that? Okay, there are quite a lot of things I could say, but I think if I think the first thing is that if anyone tried to replicate my career path exactly, they would be onto a very difficult path because some of the things that have shaped my trajectory have been random. They haven't all been positive. Um, there have been some decisions that I've taken some directions I've gone in that literally were random chance so for example my postdoc job it was a, an absolutely fantastic opportunity I if the job advert just suddenly appeared I hadn't had any prior contact with the PI I literally applied to a job that I saw on a website um, and got it and if I hadn't looked at the website at the right time if I hadn't been diligent about checking the adverts I probably wouldn't have heard that the job exists existed but it was really perfect for me and it allowed me to develop the skills that I ultimately needed to lead my own research group so 
I mean, my my career path has been shaped by several things like that. That the the conjunction of circumstances that really would be very difficult to replicate. So, in terms of how I chose the fields, it feels more like the fields chose me, and I am here because the stars lined up in a certain way, so to speak. Um, however, in terms of actually the mechanics of how you change a field, there are a couple of things that are really important. One is don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't be afraid to ask those stupid questions because they're not stupid. They're very sensible questions. Um, I mean, whether that is something completely basic or something more advanced, you need to ask them. Um, and that means that you need to know who the right people are in your um, research environment to ask. Um, the other thing is that you're going to need to go and study a lot and the terminology is going to be different and it's going to take a while to get used to a change in terminology. So you kind of need to build up the ability to shift between different languages. And once you've done it a couple of times, um, it becomes easier the next time you do it. You start knowing which words you need to go and look up and how to very rapidly get to the bottom of something that is quite a complicated topic without necessarily going and reading 50 papers. So you need to be quite strategic in how you bridge the gaps in your knowledge, picking up the the bits you need in order to make sense of it all inside your head without overwhelming yourself by going and reading 50 papers that might be very interesting but not very relevant so you need to pick the right ones to read um, and um, try and fit it all into a structure within your head and how you do that will depend on how your mind works and how you assimilate information which is a really individual thing. So some of the other research you do is in uh kind of more conventional DNA nanotechnology um, uh, and focuses on medicine. What do you mm -hmm. think are the most promising technologies for, for applying DNA nanotechnology to, to medicine in the future? Well, I think the most promising ones are the ones we haven't invented yet, actually, but that's a, that's a bit of a, um, that's a bit of a non-answer. Um, so I think when we look at the application of DNA nanotech to medicine, there are, Broadly speaking, three aspects that we can consider. We can look at diagnostics, we can look at um, treatment, or we can look at understanding um, health and disease. So into, uh, I'll talk about treatment first. So obviously with treatment, we're looking at targeted drug delivery, the, the nanorobots that go back to that wonderful paper in um, 2012. I think it was um, Douglas with the nanobot that opened um, to release the to, to, um, specifically label the cells. Um, I think that's extremely interesting. That, that that whole avenue of research is extremely interesting. Um, and we actually did a study recently looking at whether it would be cost effective to use DNA nanostructures for targeted drug delivery. Spoiler alert, it, it, it is cost effective, or we think it has the potential to be cost effective, to be more accurate. Um, but there are some major technological challenges that need to be addressed because essentially most of the research is quite abstract and there's a long way to go before DNA nanostructure enabled treatments will be um, will, will be anywhere near the clinic. So I think it's interesting, but that state, but that research is very much at, a, at an earlier stage of development than say some of the diagnostics. I think with the diagnostics side we can potentially see um, research coming to fruition and actually being translated into real world applications a bit sooner. We have to bear in mind, of course, all the time with all of this, that um, it takes a very long time for technologies to be translated and to actually get into the clinic. I mean, for therapies, you're looking at sort of 10, 15, 20 years to go through all the clinical trials and so on. So it's not a quick process. Um, on the diagnostic side, I think there's a, a lot more potential um, and there are a lot of different approaches out there for diagnosing all sorts of things. And actually, this links in more broadly with um, a topic called precision medicine, in which we are increasingly looking to stratify patients for treatment. In other words, 
select a treatment strategy based on information that we have about their disease state. And in order to have information about the disease state, we need really, really good data on the biomarker profiles, which means we need novel diagnostic technologies. And I think where DNA nanotech has the potential to contribute here is giving us novel point of care diagnostics that are much quicker and easier to use than conventional methods. Now, DNA nanotech isn't the only way to do this. There are many others, um, but I think there are some advantages to DNA nanotech specifically because of the um, a large body of research on, for example, conjugating DNA nanostructures to just about anything um, within reason um, and the versatility of, of um, the molecular programming um, that we can do with those types of structures. And of course, the third aspect of um, applications of DNA nanotech in healthcare in medicine is understanding disease. And there are some really quite interesting studies out there, um, for example, looking at using DNA nanostructures to template um, to template configurations of biomolecules that will activate the immune system and so on. And those can potentially shed light on some new aspects of, of health and disease that uh, we weren't originally aware of. And there are many such studies, and I think it would be nice to see DNA nanotechnology being made available as a platform technology for other fields to use in order to um, address the problems that they, that they face. Um, I think in some ways that is almost more achievable than the other two because it doesn't rely on a multi-year approvals process um, in principle because you're looking at work being done in research labs at the pre-clinical -pre stage you can think about getting that to fruition a lot quicker um, so I think there's some really exciting um, projects out there we have a couple of projects ongoing in relation to diagnostics we recently published um, as a preprint and now accepted for a journal, um, a study where we were looking at multiplex detection of different types of biomarkers. Um, so you have one pot, variety of different biomarkers in there, DNA, RNA, steroid hormone. And in principle, with this DNA nanostructure based assay, we can detect th those multiple biomarkers. And that's quite interesting because um, many other techniques are limited to one specific class of biomarker. So if you want to detect a steroid hormone, you go down one route. If you want to detect DNA, you go do genom genomics or some other technique. But we are quite interested in looking at, at methods that allow us to look at all of those at the same time. So I think that's quite cool. But then I'm slightly biased because we did the work. So, you know. What are the limitations of, of those one pot diagnostics? Do you think we could have a single portal or device where you just add in one sample and it gives you hundreds or thousands of data points? Well, the particular method that we um, demonstrated isn't as scalable as we would like it to be and, and the limit of detection perhaps could be improved in some areas. So those are some things that we'll be looking at with, with future projects. Um, and in, in general, when we look at um, bio, uh, biomarker detection, there are all these multiple factors that we need to weigh up. In one of um, our recent papers, we actually have um, a web diagram. So something looks like a spider's web with multiple axes like cost, time to result, number of biomarkers being detected. Um, and if you imagine one point in the center of this web, that will be the perfect biomarker detection method that detects many, many biomarkers with an ultra fast time to result. Um, incredible limits of detection and so on. In practice, you never get that. So there's usually a trade-off. For example, you can push the limit of detection down, but then you increase your time to result, or you push a limit of detection down, but you increase the cost of the assay. You've always got this trade-off between all of those real-world parameters. So I think what we really want to do is push towards that perfect biomarker detection system. But we have to recognise that there's always going to be a trade-off and that's inevitable um, because of the engineering constraints. Um, if you want to detect more biomarkers, you make something more complicated, which inevitably increases the cost over, say, a single biomarker detection method. 
um, the cost may be justified in some situations, in others it may not be. It depends what your comparator state-of-the-art technology is. And putting aside kind of just how long uh, clinical trials take for, for approval and, and all of the other um, kind of validations and other things that go on, how mature do you think our technology at the moment for both diagnostics and, and therapeutics are? I think the fundamental questions in terms of therapeutics are things like um, how will the immune system respond? Now, there's been some very interesting work on this. Some people say that it's um, not going to be a problem for the immune system. Um, there are other papers that refer to the structures as biocompatible. I think in some respects, um, we need further work on this. Um, we also need further work on thinking about this at a whole organism level. So if you're thinking about treatment in terms of cells in a dish, that doesn't translate well to the whole organism because then you've got to think about the bioavailability, about how it gets distributed through the organism. Um, I mean, human beings are not cells in a dish. Animals are not cells in a dish. So you need to think about what happens to those structures when they're in the whole body. Um, but there's a big gap between where we are and um, the human trials that would need to happen in the fullness of time. I guess I kind of want to go back to the whole question of changing fields, particularly like you, you touched on the fact that now we're, you know, we're seeing um, some people from the biological sciences moving towards, say, engineering, physics. I guess I, I, I'm trying to understand how that path can be carved out by someone because, um, I mean, learning maths is really hard, um, especially in an unstructured environment where you're just kind of already doing research. You know, learn, I guess learning maths as an undergrad is kind of easy. You just turn up, you listen, you have a structure and you learn what you learn um, and you're able to build a foundation. Learning biology by yourself is a bit easier because you can pick bits that you want to learn there's not a kind of grand foundation that needs to be built. So I'm wondering like, if you've seen it, how, how have these people who are moving from you know, the biological or the qualitative side to the quantitative side, how are they doing it? Are they just investing loads of time at the beginning for the payoff at the end? Yeah, there, there are different ways of doing it. The, um, there are some projects that are clearly more physics and engineering based that aren't actually particularly mathematical. So, for example, with data processing, you don't necessarily need to be mathematical. So doing something quantitative that involves numbers doesn't necessarily require the sort of maths that you study in undergraduate physics, for example. So there is, an, uh, there is one respect in which it's very project dependent. Um, it also depends at what career stage you're doing it. Um, I would say that if you are going if you're going to make that transition, it's probably best to do it as you go undergraduate to PhD. Doing it subsequently is going to be very, very difficult. Um, and probably the the optimal way is to take a PhD program that involves some taught courses. So you can go and do taught courses in the specific quantitative aspect that you want to develop. Alternatively, um, you do what you suggested and you go and you study one particular topic. Um, but the thing is, you don't necessarily need to learn all the maths that will come with a physics degree or an engineering degree. You learn the piece of maths that you need to do this particular problem. Sometimes that's easier said than done. So it is project dependent. There are some projects that really are not going to be very accessible and it's not practical to, to, to try that. But there are also quite a few projects in engineering that don't actually require a massive amount of maths. So engineering is not as mathematical as physics. So engineering can sometimes involve design. I mean, design is a major theme of an engineering degree. And design is something that is more accessible. So designing hardware, designing equipment is something that is easier to sort of slip into than um, hardcore mathematics. So I think it's a question of being realistic about the projects that you choose working out exactly what you need to study and where necessary there will be just a lot of studying in, in books 
but ideally you want to get into a talk course and do it um and do it in the same way that you would study for an undergraduate degree um but um another thing that's worth bearing in mind is that postdoc positions phds and so on are not always defined by the name of the department in which they are based so a P- so a phd or a postdoc position or even an academic position in the department of physics might not involve all that much physics it might actually be basically biology with a physics hat on you know um so if you're looking for vacancies you need to be very careful about limiting yourself with your keywords um when i was looking for my academic position i was not filtering at all in terms of subject i would literally go onto the main website for academic jobs in the uk every day and look for new jobs with the word lecturer in the title any field um so obviously i was seeing some that were clearly irrelevant like egyptology and english literature for example um but i probably wouldn't have found this position if i had been searching for keywords because the headline was actually um lecturer stroke senior lecturer in mechanical engineering that i probably wouldn't have put in as a keyword search but actually the position was 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 um mechanical engineering and synthetic biology so you were teaching in mechanical engineering but doing research in synthetic biology so that was what the job actually was um so i would say be careful of labeling something as physics or biology or chemistry this kind of comes back to what hannah was asking about earlier in terms of interdisciplinary um science it's not always what it says on the tin so don't assume that because a job is in the physics department it's going to involve actually writing down equations and doing hard maths it might not it might be something completely different a job in engineering might not involve making or building anything it might involve um doing genetic engineering for example so i i think it's it's important not to be blinkered and to op- open your mind and look at what's actually involved rather than the label on the department um and also to to say to yourself not what do i know how to do now but what could i learn how to do thank you so much for joining us catherine stay tuned to our newsletter or slack for details on our next podcast episodes and thanks for listening <laughs>